Hello, my name is Paul Marchbanks, and this is Digging in the Dirt. Today, I'm going to talk about our preoccupation with perfection, by way of two films released 78 years apart. Films that at first glance could not seem more dissimilar. Billy Wilder's The Lost Weekend from 1945, and Greta Gerwig's Barbie from 2023. In Wilder's film, an alcoholic whose habit leaves destruction in its wake aspires to write the next great American novel. Don Burnham longs for the creative success that will turn others' whispers behind his back into shout of acclaim. He dreams of success when drunk, but his thoughts more often turn towards death, to the internal organs he's slowly destroying, and the suicidal option that could simplify by ending his life. In the other film, a dolled-up doll lives the American dream, inhaling that rarefied air of social success which Don can only dream of breathing. The central Barbie of the film, who self-identifies as stereotypical Barbie, has a network of girlfriends and interested guys who endlessly feed her sense of contentment. These two characters' North American worlds could not lie further apart. Barbie's carefully manicured town, which has been dipped in bright colors and polished to a sheen, exists somewhere in the West within a hop, skip, car trip, and boat ride of Los Angeles. Dawn's monochromatic, claustrophobic existence on New York's Third Avenue lacks any vibrancy, despite the fact that he has a devoted girlfriend and brother concerned about his well-being. The film's black-and-white visual schema sharpens the shadows cast by the liquor stores, bars, and pawn shops he frequents. One of our characters sits atop the world. The other stumbles blindly in its basement. Don and Barbie do share, however, a similar quandary. They are beholden to social standards, which offer the prospect of shame if they try to hide their struggles, and possibly freedom if they share their troubles openly. How should we respond to the various ideals that alternately inspire and oppress us? Each of these two films wrestles with this question rather directly. Most of us have goals of some sort, including those which may lie far out of reach. Elusive goals can be inspiring, can pull us out of our comfort zone, and drive us towards excellence we thought unreachable, even if we never touch the high bar we've set ourselves. As the Renaissance painter Andrea del Sarto observes in a poem by Robert Browning, man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? Other times, of course, the existence of an inaccessible ideal may merely discourage us, witness the mental health problems spawned by our attempts to look just like the carefully lit, angled, and tweaked images of celebrities scattered across social media. The failure to replicate another person's skills, personality, or body, instead of being okay with refining what we already have, can lead to not only depression, but illogical humiliation, as if we failed the universe by not transforming into someone else. Another reason this struggle can be so disheartening is that the object of our desire is a moving target, one transformed by the latest news story, hit single, box office smash, or viral video. Inner peace of any sort is going to prove rather impossible when we're pursuing a constantly shifting dream, unsure as to which ideal we're supposed to be chasing, the creative excellence of a Pablo Picasso or that posed by an unexpected NFT, the intellectual brilliance of a Katherine Johnson or that of Dr. Shirley Jackson, a figure like Sandra O's oh or Halle Bailey's. If we add others' critical judgments to our own disparaging self-evaluation, confidence can seem impossible. A few cruel voices or equally damaging silent stares can close a seemingly endless feedback loop of negativity. How do we break out of such a trap, and are some escape routes more reliable than others? One way to combat the stigma attached to our supposed inadequacy 
is to stretch the ideal so that it becomes less and less exclusive, so enlarging its parameters that it now encompasses much of the variability and difference it once rejected. We notice, for instance, that publishing success hinges a whole lot on connections within the industry and so decide that every novel ever written must be worth our time, whether it appears on a bestsellers list or not. In a period of economic upheaval, which forces bankruptcy on our business competitors, we choose to claim victory for merely managing to stay afloat. Isn't this healthier? than obsessing over the fluctuating value of our stock? And if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, perhaps we should consider everyone attractive. Barbie signals this response to constraining standards when encountering an elderly woman for the first time, she calls her beautiful. We can redefine normality as well as our ideals, reimagining labels like diseased, disabled, and addicted, which often serve more of a divisive function than a practical medical one. What if we stopped devaluing others because of the compromised state of their bodies or minds, since we all become disabled if we live long enough? Should we instead begin to consider everyone who's currently without a disabling condition temporarily abled? Rather than turning those with diseases into pariahs and addicts into villains, should we temper our aversion with a reminder that we all catch infectious illnesses at some point, and that everyone struggles with irrational compulsions, whether they involve controlled substances, social media, or romantic partners? We might be inclined to laugh at Ken's silly obsession with Barbie and scorn Don for his weakness. But most of us have felt persistent, unrequited affection for another person at some point. And as Helen reminds Don, thousands of others share his struggle with addiction. We're all so much more similar than we like to think. Another way to respond to high ideals involves knocking them down, attacking them as unjust, unreasonable, or simply absurd. Young Sasha does this when she meets Barbie and promptly eviscerates her, labeling her a fascist for incarnating impossible standards that have pulled the wind out of feminist sails. In the same way, we can deconstruct athletic bodies as ephemeral, wealth as socially unjust, and professional triumphs as a function of chance as much as effort. Burn all those standards to the ground, since life is unfair. The distribution of resources and opportunity remains inequitable, and the weight we traditionally give to any kind of excellence is a millstone around our neck, likely to drown us in our deep sense of inadequacy. A life without limits requires, according to this approach, the erasure of many benchmarks, standards, and toxic forms of exceptionalism. Lastly, we could instead pull the so-called ideal up by its roots and replant it upside down, flip it. Perhaps we should not only question the ideal, but celebrate the stigmatized differences it once persuaded us to reject. Strength in weakness, perfectly imperfect. Workers unite. Black is beautiful. Don does this himself, but unfortunately in a markedly unhealthy way, when he convinces himself that getting drunk actually provides him with inspiration and creative direction. Pushing aside the damage done to his health, his relationships, and his wallet, he creates castles in the air held aloft by the fumes of his booze. At the beginning of their respective films, neither Barbie nor Dawn responds to high standards in a healthy way. Greta Gerwig's Barbie has lived a perfect life for so long that when something unexpectedly changes, she doesn't know how to respond. One morning, her perpetually raised feet unexpectedly yield to gravity and fall into a normal arch. The instant her heels touch terra firma, she also experiences her first distress, horrified that all the other still perfect Barbies will catch sight of her abhorrent difference and, what, pity her? Mock her? 
and it's hard to imagine how her friends might react since there's no evidence of cruelty in Barbie land. But the specter of the unknown terrifies Barbie as much as her misshapen feet. In an instant, she falls into gloom. The ideal standard she helped perpetuate now standing in judgment, and she desperately tries to hide her difference. An unexpected variable has been introduced into a closed system and mortality materializes because, you know, if change is possible, then entropy follows and death rides in on its coattails. The rest of the film explores healthy and unhealthy ways to respond to impossible standards. Watch for Gloria's speech midway through the movie. Pretty powerful. Billy Wilder's fifth feature film opens in a New York apartment with Don packing for a weekend away with his brother. A vacation, Wick has proposed to get a haggard-looking Don out of the city and away from liquid temptation. While packing his suitcase, Don's mind darts out the window and circles the bottle he's secretly hung from the hinge. Ten days of sobriety have not killed the longing which inspires an elaborate lie spun in hopes of getting Wick out of the room so that Don can hide the bottle in his luggage. Though he talks about riding alone in his room during their getaway, he plans on using the solitude to dump the contents of a whiskey bottle down his throat. He and his brother will be staying next to a country club, but Don sees only possible gossipers, not potential friends, in this temporary community. His guilt converts this prospect of connection into a haunting specter of shame. Outside, the circle of intimacy formed by others is easy for him to see himself as being judged by the rules of social decorum and propriety. Does he eventually, effectively, swallow his pride and share his inner conflict with others, allowing their camaraderie to temper his self-hate? I'll leave it to you to decide. What do you think? Do either of these films provide us with practical wisdom for dealing with our own many imperfections.